So yeah, my name is Sheena. It's nice to meet you. This is a picture of me, a remarkable likeness. So my job title's a bit weird. I'm the product and tech enablement lead at Omuzi, and that's a mouthful. But um, basically what Omuzi is, is we, we train people in different um, digital skills. I'm involved in software development things, um, often in Python things, sometimes JavaScript, sometimes other things. Um, Basically, what I do at Amuzi is I build remote education systems, and that's composed of a bunch of different parts. So there's development work, there's running a dev team, there's um, creating and vetting syllabuses, uh, do UX, and then there's pedagogy, andragogy, hutagogy, which is all hard to say, but it basically means the way that we teach. Um, that stuff that sits with me. Python is my love language, um, and these are my emojis. So. Um, our purpose is to reduce social inequality through education. And we're based in South Africa, that's, that's our vibe. But in order to get this right, we need to teach people about skills that they'll need for the long game. They need to be able to, like we don't want to just set people up with little micro gigs and a way to get through the month. We want to set them up with a way to get through the next five, 10, 15 years. And to do that, we, we need to play the long game. And so we need to think a lot about what the future will look like. And that's really, really hard. Like in tech, that's really hard generally, but it's even harder now because of this whole AI thing. It's, uh, there's a lot of, there is a lot of hype going on and there's a lot of excitement going on and things are changing very, very quickly. And so looking to the future, looking like we need to look to the future to figure out what to teach people now. So this talk is going to be a lot about cutting away some hype of AI, but before I do that, I want to make it clear that I'm actually a huge freaking fan, like a big fan. I use it all the time. So I use LLMs while I'm writing code. I think they're very useful in education generally, um, if used correctly. Um, but I also believe that they're about the biggest foot gun around for people who are busy learning to code for the first time. And that's because there's a lot of assumptions that people are making and a lot of um, bad conclusions that people are, are coming to. So <clears throat> before I can talk about how people are shooting themselves in the foot while learning software development, let's talk a little bit about what software development is. So a software developer's job is to write lines of code Right? No? That's not how we measure our productivity. And so typing out lines of code quickly is, is not the vibe. What we are trying to do is solve problems. And code is an artifact. It's, it's the output of our problem solving method. Um, but we're solving problems. But even beyond that, like sometimes you don't even know what problems to solve. So a software de developer's job is often just to like figure out where to even go, um, what problem what the problem even is. So it's not like this. It's not like you have this idea and you're like, great, and then you translate the idea into code. It's not like I have a problem and I have a solution and I translate the solution into code. It's not a specification that you translate into code. It's not a translation service. We, we do start off with some kind of idea, some kind of problem, and it's, it's a bad idea. Um, it's a bad idea because it's full of assumptions. Uh, it's got assumptions about the world. So let's say that you want to build the next Uber of dog walking apps. Prague is great. I've been seeing so many people walking dogs and you're like, target market, fantastic. Um, this idea would be full of assumptions about how people care about their dogs and feel about strangers and what their economic um, situation is. So it's full of assumptions about the world. It's full of assumptions about what is possible with current technology. So. This is especially true if you're working with like a non-technical stakeholder who like often they just aren't super sure what you can do. Um, if you are a technical stakeholder, you're also pretty like not sure what you can do a lot of the time. Like does this tool do what it advertises? It's hard to know without even trying. Um, and with LLMs and AIs developing the way that they are, it's very, very hard to know what, <laughs> what these tools are even capable of until you get your hands dirty. There's also a lot of assumptions about shared understanding. So if I'm talking about the Uber of dog walking, and so are you, then we might be talking about slightly different things. We have slightly different contexts. We are going to be using the same words and understanding them differently. So 
we do our best. We, we come up with these ideas and then we try to communicate them with each other and we communicate them imprecisely. Like we draw pictures, we, we have flow charts and research artifacts and conversations and wireframes and documentations and text messages and it's, it's a lot and it's insufficient. The most precise way to describe what a program should do is by writing the code. So it's not like we start off with a perfectly specified idea and then we translate it into perfect code. If this was the case, then sure, AI could do our jobs, easy peasy. But it's not the case. We have follow-up questions, we push back on requirements, we consider trade-offs, we make suggestions, we get inspired, we have empathy. Even developers need a bit of empathy. We create an architecture, we like try our best to choose the right tools because that's freaking difficult actually. And we spend a lot of time trying to just validate and revalidate our solution. So it's it's a mess. It's like a it's a collaborative process, it's an iterative process and it's exploratory. It's not a straight line. Oh, golly. There's a video here that I'm linking to. Um, it's got a great thumbnail, I promise. And it's by Dave Farley. And <laughs> he, um, he, he, he explains this thing that I just explained. He, he does a better job of it. I highly, highly recommend that you watch this fantastic video on your own later. <laughs> I wasn't going to play it now. Watching YouTube together is <laughs> not, not the most fun. Um, so we've spoken a lot about what software development is. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about code, because code is the output of this process. So code has changed a lot over the years. It started off looking a lot like this, or early on in its evolution it looked like, a lot like this. So what we're looking at here is a punch card. Um, who hasn't heard of punch cards? Who has heard of punch cards? Yeah, basically everyone. So punch cards, uh, they did their job. They, they were the only tool available at the time, but they kind of sucked. Um, it's a physical thing that you need to make holes in, in the right place, and if you screw it up, you have to like throw the whole card away and get a new one and make the holes in the right place. Eventually, you have a program, which is a stack of cards that you carry to a room-sized computer and you feed in in the right order, and if you get it wrong, you have to start again, and if you make a mistake and need to debug this thing, there aren't tests, there isn't a debugger, you just have to lay these things out and think really hard, and it's, it's tough. Um, this type of programming doesn't feel very human. It doesn't feel very humane either. It's very close to the machine. It's very close to the mechanics of how the machine works. But at the time, that's what we had. Time passed, abstraction happened. So abstraction um, can be, here's a good example of abstraction, a car. Um, so if you're driving a car, then you are sitting in the driver's seat, you've got a wheel, you've got some pedals, you've got a way to turn the thing on. You don't need to think about what's under the hood. When you start a car, when you turn the, the, the key for the ignition or press the button, you don't need to care about the starter motor, you don't need to care about the carburetor or the alternator or the fuel injection system or if it's an electric car. Uh, you, you just turn the thing on. You've got a little tiny mechanism and a whole lot of complexity happens in the background and that's abstraction. So programming languages became more abstract. We got to a point where we had things like C and C++ and those are great because they introduced concepts like functions and loops and variables and that made life way, way easier and that made programming much more human and much more humane. Eventually we got to things like Python, which, which are fantastic, like Python, abstracts things even further. In C and C++, you still need to care about memory management, but now you, you don't so much anymore. Um, you are able to just focus on the algorithm, on the problem that you're trying to solve, and not worry about the details. And that's fantastic. As time continues, we move further and further away from the machine, and the languages that we use become more human. They, they fit in our hands like, like tools that were designed for our hands, and human languages, like the one I'm speaking now, English, is like they, they're even more human. Is it possible that our programming languages will become human languages? Will these things be interchangeable? Now, it's reasonable to assume that things will keep evolving and they'll become more human, but how might the languages change? So human languages are 
inaccurate, they're imprecise, and they're confusing. Um, we talk at cross purposes all the time. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples as how, about how things go wrong. So the presence or absence of a comma can change the meaning of a sentence. So the koala eats, shoots, and leaves. Is it a hungry koala? Is it a hungry and violent koala? It's hard to know. <laughs> She ran away from the fire in her pajamas. Why were her pajamas on fire? Or was it at night? Now, these might seem like silly, silly examples, but there's, there's more. So a lot of words just get commonly mistaken. They, they sound the same. They look the same. So people swap them around there and there, two and two, it's and it's. Things are misused a lot, borrow versus lend. Um, a lot of people have asked me, like, can can you borrow me your pen? Things like that. It's like, no, I can't. It's physically impossible. I'm sorry, but I can lend it to you. Um, literally, now means figuratively, which is the opposite. It's also important to stay hip with the times. Like, it's very... <laughs> um, human languages are not only for describing like situations in life and algorithms and instructions. It's also about group membership. And so they change all the time. Um, we have words like goat that no longer means these things. It's, it's something else now. And uh, like all of this for me just seems pretty bananas, uh, which is a type of fruit. Um, <laughs> so uh, these might seem like silly examples, but we have a certain profession um, of, of people that exist. They get paid quite a lot of money. And their job is to be very incredibly precise in their speech and to use language perfectly well. These are called lawyers. Um, they mess up a lot. There's a semicolon in the US Constitution that is quite famous because it confuses some very clever lawyers and changes the meaning of the US Constitution. You can learn about it if you want to. There's a revisionist history art, um, <laughs> podcast about it. So, so it's quite a big deal. And a lot of the time you might think like English is, is good enough. And it often is. Like we can explain certain things in English. I, I'm, I'm not, like I, I don't want to bash human languages. I use them myself sometimes, even in this presentation. Um, <laughs> but we have to use the right tool for the job. So in English, uh, like a, a human language is a little bit like a hammer. It's a bit like a blunt instrument. It solves certain problems. Um, where would we be as a species without hammers? Like we, we wouldn't have gotten that far. Hammers are great. But if you really need a laser beam, you need a laser beam. So human languages are a lot like hammers. Programming languages are way, way more precise. They cannot be mistaken. If you write something down in Python, it means only one thing. So it's more like a laser beam. But C is still a thing. So sometimes Python is not accurate enough. It's not precise enough. And so you need to get closer to the machine. Assembler is still a thing. So I spent some time working in power stations for a while, and basically all the code we wrote was in assembler language. And it was loads of fun, but I wouldn't want to build a web app in it. Um, but it's still, it's got its use cases even now. So code is a precise description of what machines should do. And English and other human languages are not precise enough for many problems. If you look at code up close, it just tells you what order things should happen in, under what circumstances they should happen, where knowledge comes from, where it goes, its parameters, its variables, um, how do things change over time, when things repeat, that's loops. If you look at it up close, it's logic and algorithms, and it's just written in a way that's, that's clear for machines. And it's also, importantly, written in a way that's clear to people. Good code makes its intentions clear to people. So what's going to get abstracted away? There will be more abstractions, I am quite, quite sure. But we're not going to get rid of if statements, loops, or flow control. I'm going to give you some very human examples of these things. Um, if I'm out of milk, go to the shop and buy some milk. Um, while there are dirty windows, clean the next window. We're not going to get rid of functions. A function is just a name for a, a section of, for like an algorithm. So go to the shops and buy milk. That could be a function with an input, milk. We, that's the thing we want to buy. Um, and it's got a series of steps that it contains, like head out the door, take a left, take a right. Not variables. We're going to keep those. Like how much does the milk cost? Not even classes and objects. So for people who are new to programming, they might feel like classes and objects are advanced things. But really, this is an object. It's of class cell phone. You've got one too. 
Um, yeah, so it's, it's a very normal human thing. Even exceptions and errors. If I, go to the milk, uh, if I go to the shop to buy some milk and there's no milk, error, go to a different shop. So exception handling and error handling is very, very normal. So to say that these things will get abstracted away, that doesn't make sense. We're still going to want to implement algorithms and tell machines precisely what we need done. So what's going to get abstracted away? Not our ability to solve problems, not our ability to express ourselves, not our ability to describe algorithms precisely. We're still going to need to do that. So, so far we've spoken about what software development is. It's collaborative, it's exploratory, it's an iterative problem-solving method, and the output is code, which is a precise and clear description of what machines should do, and it's clear to humans. So, now the crux of the talk. AI is a foot gun for people learning how to code. It's a foot gun for a lot of different reasons. Isn't this a cool picture? <laughs> um, <laughs> so the reason people are shooting themselves in the foot with AI is because things are genuinely confusing. When people are starting out in their coding career, they're not really sure what software development is. They are given certain things to do, and they're given certain advice, and they follow that advice, and then they're like, wow, this, this does not compute. So one thing that new developers are told to do is like go and practice their problem solving skills and they'll use tools like HackerRank and LeetCode and all of that. Um, so these are basically platforms where there are word problems and the coder will take those problems and they'll translate it, like come up with a solution, translate it into code. And the thing is that LLMs do that better. Um, that's what it seems like. If you, if you take a problem from HackerRank and feed it to, to ChatGPT, then it'll split out an answer. And so it's like, why are we even practicing this skill? LLMs can do it better. Why not rather just get really, really good at using LLMs and then get them to do the hard part, which is writing the code? Writing the code isn't the hard part, you guys. So another way, that, another confusing thing is, is this. So, there are a bunch of problems that new developers can solve. And they're small problems, and there's a few of them, and they're this big. And then there's problems that ChatGPT can solve, and they're this big. And for a person to become better than ChatGPT, they need to at least solve problems this big, which are far out of reach of ChatGPT. Most software development problems are like much, much bigger than that. Uh, many, many thousands of lines of code um, that are contributed to by like large teams of people over months and years. All of that stuff is out of reach. But AI is going to get better, right? Like, yes, definitely. Definitely it's going to get better. It, they are going to be able to do harder things, 100%. They are going to be able to do things with larger token limits. They're not going to be as limited in terms of the amount of text they can take in and the amount that they can produce. And so it's easy to say, like, why should we even try to outpace the LLMs? Are we just going to be redundant? Like they're going to they're going to keep like getting bigger and be better. And if we're trying to stay a step ahead, is that just fairly pointless? And personally, <laughs> I do not at all believe that software devel developers will become redundant. I think things are going to change definitely. But I think our capacity to solve problems and tell machines what to do that sticks around. So um, I I definitely. <laughs> will say that software devs are not re going to become redund redundant. What I think we need to do is look at these problems in a different way. So let's say you're learning a language like French or Japanese or whatever. When you start learning the language, you start off by translating simple things from one language to another. You, you start off by taking a word or a sentence, a hello, a how are you, and you just translate them. And you realize that this is a first step you realize that the goal isn't so that uh, isn't to translate simple sentences. The goal is to express yourself and understand other people's expressions. The goal is to unlock ideas and communication. And it's very obvious when you're learning a human language, but it's less obvious when you're learning code. When people start learning code, they start off by translating simple problems into code. And this is done on things like HackerRank, but it's also done in like programming courses, in programming textbooks, anything like that. That like write some code that does this, and you're like, okay, I will translate the human language stuff into the code language stuff. That's not what software development is, but it's the first step. Remember, we're not a translation service. 
We are, what software development is, is a collaborative, iterative, exploratory process, and code is the output of that process. In order to do the stuff, you need to learn to be literate. And so the first step of learning to program is learning that literacy. It's not the whole step. It's not the whole process. So when you're learning to code, this is what it's like, which is why people get confused. But can't an AI learn all the skills of software development? So, I mean, it, that whole process of like having pushback and considering different ideas and researching different tools, can AI do that? The thing is that it's like, we're pretty far from AGI still, and this is becoming quite a, a general problem. So, there's a lot of hype to cut through. Part of the hype, um, <laughs> so, something else that is, is very confusing to people is that they believe that AIs can, in fact, um, solve a certain level of problem without um, when it's a new problem. So you, you, you give it a, a little word problem and it can output the code. Um, people see this in HackerRank and whatnot. But there, are, um, there has been some evidence that AIs or LLMs are only really good at problem solving problems that they've seen before. So uh, Jody, can you wave? Hey, so I got these references from her talk at PyCon Italia, and it was just freaking cool. So, woo. <laughs> um, basically, there's another like code um, practice platform called CodeForce, and they published a bunch of problems before LLMs were really such a thing, before ChatGPT was trained. And then they pu published a bunch of new problems afterwards. And then they're like, hey, ChatGP ChatGPT, solve these problems. And it could solve the old ones, and it sucked at the new ones, even though they were at the same difficulty level. There's strong, strong evidence that these things have simply memorized the solutions rather than um, being able to come up with the solutions themselves. And in a lot of fields, memorization and mastery are kind of very interrelated. So if you wanted to be a lawyer, for example, there's a lot of stuff you'd need to memorize. If you wanted to be a historian, you'd need to know dates and names and places. And if you're really good at remembering that stuff, then it's like, okay, cool, you're a good historian. But with programming, memorization is not understanding. If people just memorize things and pattern match like that, then that's called cargo culting, and that is bad. So, another video with a great, great thumbnail. This is Jody's talk, <laughs> which you should watch because it's full of references and it cuts through like a lot of the hype. Um, <laughs> yes. So, in order to become a software developer, one must start with literacy. You learn to write by translating simple ideas into code, and then you learn to apply that literacy to solve small problems so that you can start to apply those skills on larger problems. So, so tools like HackerRank and LeetCode and all of that and CodeForce, I'm, I'm all for them. I think they're fantastic. Um, solve the problems yourselves. So let's just, uh, we've been talking about code a lot. Let's talk about this shiny, shiny man. Um, <laughs> so how do you think he got so good at lifting heavy things in his underpants? It wasn't like this. Software developers, we solve problems, and we don't learn to solve problems like this. Problem solving is not a skill, it's a set of skills. And in order to develop that set of skills, you actually need to practice, you need to do the reps, you need to work on your brain. So apply what you know to solve small problems so that you can learn to solve bigger problems. The other thing is precision. So these small problems, maybe a lot of them can be explained in English. Maybe they can be, maybe you can be precise enough in human speech, um, in human written language, in order to describe the algorithm that you're trying to implement. But these are beginner-friendly problems. Beginner-friendly problems are simple enough that maybe a blunt instrument can do the trick. But if you want to actually get to a point where you can talk about very complicated algorithms, then you need to practice precision. So sometimes you can solve things with a hammer, but it would be a good idea to learn how to use a laser beam. So how do you do that? So precisely describe some simple problems. Actually use the programming language. Again, like learning the programming language is not the hardest part of learning to be a programmer. And then once you have those skills, you can do bigger problems. So remember that the most precise way to describe what a program should do is in code, you need that skill. All right, so 
another angle to think about coding is you learn to code in order to learn to think. And this might seem like a very self-important thing to say. I'm like, I'm a programmer, I can think better than you. But it's, um, it's actually quite a solid thing because if you can learn to code, you can get feedback on the way you think. So if you can express your thoughts precisely, then you can get feedback from people. So if you're working on a team, then your teammates can look at your code and say like, have you considered? Um, did you think about doing it this way? Why did you do it that way? You can get feedback from the world. So if you have that dog walking app um, that I spoke about earlier, maybe you will learn some things about people and their dogs and their spending habits and their walking habits. You can get feedback from your future selves. So this is quite a big one. If you are learning, if you're working on a small beginner-friendly problem, then it's going to be like tens or hundreds of lines of code, and it's not going to take long, like maybe maybe minutes, maybe a week, something like that. It's it's small stuff, but. As you build bigger and bigger things, you end up with these code bases that are huge, like many thousands of lines of code, many people involved, many, um, uh, like a lot of time spent. You might write a piece of code and leave for like months and then go back to that piece of code and you'll look at that code and you'll think to yourself, what bastard did this? I will find them. And then you get blamed, you're like, oh no, <laughs> oh no, it was me. And by going through that, you, you see your own rational shortcomings and you see the things that you weren't paying attention to, that you weren't diligent enough about, where you weren't conscientious enough to be like, let me just do this right the first time. You see the debt that you implemented. And from doing that, you get to be better. You get to learn how to pay attention in different ways. And that's super powerful. So that act of just like often getting good at a thing is learning to, you learn about what to pay attention to, and then you learn how to react to the things that you notice. And that's something that you get from working on big pieces of code in a very precise way. So let you harden your own thinking. You guys have heard of Sam Altman? This guy? So he says, you should learn to code. Learning to code was great as a way to learn how to think. I think coding will still be important in the future. And he still writes code himself sometimes. Um, OpenAI still hires developers as well, if you need like a metric of how, <laughs> how useful it is right now. Um, on top of that, there's like the act of writing code, but reading code is also quite amazing. So imagine one day you wake up in the morning and you can read Japanese. It's like, damn, that's cool. Um, you have access to great minds, great thinkers. You have access to literature and other ideas. And you, you have access to a whole culture that you otherwise would not have access to. And it opens doors um, in your mind and in your ability to affect the world. And you get to turn the subtitles off on your anime, which is also a winner. Reading code is a lot like that. Um, so if you read code, you get to read the minds of your teammates. Um, code is a little bit like crystallized thought. It's beautiful. And you can see a lot about how a person thinks and how a person approaches problems by reading what they produce. You can read the minds of powerful thinkers as well. So we are at an open source conference. And if you're working with open source tools, like even if you're not contributing to them, sometimes you're just like, how does this work? Let me go read the source code. And then you learn about how other people do things. So it's important to learn to code. It's, it's very, very useful. The next question is, can AI be helpful in learning to code? And the answer is resoundingly yes. But, but, remember our old friend. There's this thing called an illusion of competence that comes out up like a lot. So I've taught many people to code myself. I've taught teachers to teach people how to code. Like they, I've got a lot of experience with teaching people code. And this comes up so much. An illusion of competence is when you think your ability is up here, but it's really down here. And I'm sure that many people here have personal experience in it or um, have, have seen it in other, peop in other places. So an example is like, take yourself back to school. Um, have you ever written a test where you thought you aced the test, you thought you, you like smashed it, and then you got the marks back and it turned out that you flunked? Um, that's an experience that many people have had where they're just like, oh, I thought I was good, but I'm not. Um, another experience a lot of people have is like, 
meeting somebody, perhaps you wouldn't do this yourself, but meeting somebody who'd read like three blog articles on the topic and now they're the expert, um, that's also an illusion of competence, it comes up a lot. So this guy, Richard Feynman, um, he's fantastic. He's a, he's a physicist, he got the Nobel Prize for Physics and he's quite a genius and a multifaceted, um, very entertaining person. He says, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So nobody is beyond this, nobody is above this. Um, people are, people at all stages are very able to, to fool themselves. So illusions of competence comes from a number of different things. The one is a thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is that feeling that if you're slightly familiar with something and it feels pretty comfortable in your brain, even though you're only familiar with the tip of the iceberg, you think that you understand the whole iceberg. So that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. The next thing is an overconfidence in your future self. If I learn a skill now, and I master the skill now, or I feel like I've mastered it, and I'm performing it, and I'm doing totally fine, I will remember I'm confident in this. A month from now, I'll still remember I nailed that, I know how to do it. But the actual memory of how to do it is very likely to go away, these things decay. And so mastery is not housed in your short-term memory. If you learn a skill now, you might not retain it. You are very unlikely to, unless you do some, some like intentional things about it. The last one is hindsight bias. So this is a big one. Um, if you see a problem and you see a solution to the problem and you look at the solution and you're, you understand the solution, you'll think that the solution is obvious. It's, it clearly follows from the problem. So this happens a lot with people who are learning how to code. They'll, like, um, they'll see a problem, they'll get the solution, maybe from an LLM, and then they'll, they'll look at the solution, they'll be like, yeah, I'm really clever. I could have come up with that, and they'll stroke their ego, and they'll move on to the next problem. But they couldn't have come up with it. So mastery is something that you need to pursue in the beginning of a coding journey. You don't need to master every framework and every, every little thing, but mastering the fundamentals is, is quite critical. So mastery and familiarity are not the same thing, even though sometimes they feel like the same thing. Mastery does not come from nodding while someone or something else does the thinking for you. It is not housed in your short-term memory. It comes from deliberate practice. And it comes from recall. So there's a lot of science to how learning works and how education works. Um, if you learn a thing and you force yourself to remember the thing later on, then it gets more solid in your, in your longer-term memory. It gets solidified there. The other thing is struggle, and that's important. So a lot of people avoid struggle. If learning a thing feels hard, then they're like, oh, I must be doing it wrong. No, if it's hard, you're probably doing it right. You should be pushing yourself. Um, there's actually evidence to say that the more challenged you are by a subject, the more you're absorbing and the more you're actually growing from, from digging into it. And so embrace the hard path. So for people who are learning to code, they should always try to do things themselves first give themselves the opportunity to be wrong. If somebody has the opportunity to be wrong about something, if they have the opportunity to stumble and fall, um, then they have the opportunity to upgrade themselves. They can see where their flaws are and get out of it. If they get stuck, they should get unstuck. So there's no point in just hitting your head against a wall, like trying to understand a thing or trying to get over a problem that's ac actually like clearly outside of your abilities. But get unstuck, that's okay. But be intentional about it. Don't have that as the first step. Don't be lazy about it. Say like, okay, cool, this reveals that I have a deficiency in this area. Try to recall those deficiencies. Try to build on those deficiencies. Um, get better over time. And then the last thing that I like to recommend is a thing called, um, well, it's a thing related to the protege effect. So again, there's a lot of science around how to learn well and how to teach well. So the protege effect is the thing that says that if you learn something in order to teach someone else, you actually learn it way, way better. So if I learn something simply with the intention of teaching someone else, I'm going to pay attention to it in different ways and I'm going to think of different ways to explain it. Um, if I actually go through the act of teaching someone else, then that's a form of recall. I need to remember stuff so I can tell you. I need to phrase things in different ways and I need to take questions. And sometimes if a person asks me a question, the answer will be, I don't know. And that's revealing for me. And sometimes when somebody asks me a question, it'll seem, seem so left field and off center that it'll make me look at things in a different way. This actually 
it's very, very useful because it helps you to build mental frameworks about the things that you know, and it makes you retain the stuff better and understand new concepts better. So that is the recommendation. So the future-proof skill set, in summary, it's all about discovering and solving problems collaboratively. It's about algorithmic thinking. It's about communication with precision, and it's about learning. So becoming code literate is a foundation to all of that. The end. Thank you, Sheena. Cool. So we've got a few minutes for questions. If people want to go up to the microphones, we can, we can go through these. Um, I, I've got a question. Cool. So if you, I was wondering if you use LLMs in your work, and if you do, is there a th flow you would recommend to use it like this? Um, so in my personal work, mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll use something like Copilot while I'm coding, and it's really useful, and it does speed me up, and it stops me from having to look up the documentation every time I forget like that weird function name, which is great. But I do find that if I'm trying to solve something novel, I have to turn it off because otherwise it gets just very, very distracting. So I'm always turning it on, then turning it off, then turning it on, then turning it off. I find um, I turn it off at the beginning of a problem, and then once I've got like the general flow of things, and once the, the pattern of what I'm doing is, is more obvious, then I can turn on the pattern matching machine, and it can fill in some gaps for me. And that's been very, very helpful, and it speed, speeds me up. Um, when it comes to people who are learning to code, I say, like, don't even turn it on. Like, don't, that's not the right tool at this point in, in the journey. Like, if somebody's just learning, then that can just distract them, make suggestions that they can't necessarily use. Um, so, like, one thing with using LLMs while coding is that you need to be able to take their suggestions and add a pinch of salt. And people who are learning to code don't necessarily have the capability to add that pinch of salt yet. They don't have that nuanced understanding. And so it, for them, it's, it's a tricky, dangerous tool. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for this talk. I, I really like your focus on uh, code as an expression of where somebody thinks um, that isn't something that I had clarified as a thought before. So that, that was kind of, I'm thanks. still processing that at the moment. <laughs> um, I do have a question. Uh, so it, some of the ways of using LLMs in learning aren't necessarily completely obvious. Like Simon Willison, I think, talked about, um, instead of getting the, getting the LLM to write the code for him, um, he writes the code and then gives it to the LLM and basically says, how can I improve this? Mm. Which I think is really interesting, especially if you're learning in an environment where there aren't other people around to yeah. kind of help you. Um, but given that LLMs also quite often make things up or have bad opinions, yeah. like, is there a way that somebody who doesn't necessarily know how to judge opinions, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they, it, it, is, is there a way to use an LLM to learn in that way that doesn't sort of potentially yeah. leave you vulnerable to going astray? So that's also ridiculously difficult, actually. So I've tried to use LLMs to review the code of our students because code review is just a massive workload that we have, and it's, ac it's pretty expensive to, to have humans do it. But it's really tough to get it right because the LLMs do say very, um, so sometimes th there's a few things to tune. The one is like how strict they should be. And a lot of the time, if you don't push it to be kind of strict, it'll just say everything goes. It'll be like, yeah, it sort of works. It's, it's great. Um, or if you t push it to be strict, then it will be really over the top sometimes. It'll say like every single one of your unit tests needs to have a full doc string. It's like, are you sure? <laughs> and so it makes up these requirements. And a lot of the hallucinations from uh, that it comes up with are, you have to remember how the thing was trained as well. So these LLMs were trained on a vast body of like open source code. And not all code is good. Most code really isn't. Like a lot of the repos on, on GitHub are, th are like a person learning a thing for the first time or a person trying a thing for the first time, abandoned projects, a cool idea that died. And so there's a lot of bad practices in there. Um, and so you can't necessarily just like just take it as it, as it goes. Um, when teaching people to code, it's like cargo culting is a huge, huge problem. Um, 
it's really hard to get over. And so if you have a, like an AI auto marker thing that makes like hard suggestions like do the code like this so that it is correct, then a lot of people will just like believe it and do it that way without necessarily understanding. So for us, we haven't found a good way to get the, get the learners to interact about like code projects with an LLM. Some things that have been useful is, um, so we do have some automations around marking projects and whatnot, and one of the things we do is we ask our learners to, at some point in the program, like write error messages that make sense to people, and then we can use an LLM to say, like, does this sort of mean this? But then we don't really need an LLM, we just need um, a way to vectorize sentences. Um, Another thing that's really, really helpful is recall and um, asking weird questions. So if we know that a learner has gone through like this text over here, then we can ask them multiple choice questions if we want to. We can ask them uh, longer form questions as well. And that thing that I was talking about earlier around um, dealing with like off-center left field questions from your friends that you're trying to teach like that's actually really really useful so one of the things that differentiates people's ability to learn there, there are a bunch but like one thing that's super powerful is a thing called structure building so a person who's a strong structure builder is a is the kind of person who is more able to take a collection of facts and turn it into a framework in their mind where these things are connected and related and affect each other in different ways not everybody is naturally good at that. But you can take a weak structure builder and turn them into a stronger structure builder by getting them explicitly to look at their stuff from different directions. And so we can say something to a learner like, given this body of text, how does this connect to that? And we can ask questions around that, and we can ask questions around this. And, and so it's, um, you can automatically generate these almost like conversation starters, which really help people, yeah. Thanks very much. Cool. We have time for maybe one more quick question. If you go up to the microphone, um, yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, sh shouldn't the people who try to enter software engineering, those who take the harder uh, way, like learning the fundamentals, shouldn't they still be worried that people who take the easier part will be favored by companies and in interviews? Um, so this, this question itself is it's quite a good one because there's multiple layers to it. So something that I've seen a lot of is resume padding where a person will get like basic familiarity with like 20 different tools because they did the basic tutorial and they'll put all that stuff on their CV and they'll say, I know this. And so they'll look good and they'll get called to the interviews where somebody who's like genuine about the skills that they have, and they're like, I know this one thing really well, they just don't look as good. And so they don't get invited to the interviews. And that's a, that's a big like ecosystem problem that needs to be solved. But then when it comes to actually writing the code, if the only way you can write code, actually let, let's have a scenario. Let's say um, you're my boss and you give me a project and you're like, here's a, here's a specification that I want you to convert into code, I'm like, Okay, cool, and so I take that specification, I dump it into ChatGPT, I generate some code and I give it back to you. Here, I have done my work. Now, you didn't necessarily need to use me as a middleman, and I couldn't check my work. I couldn't check for hallucinations. I could just like dump the stuff and then dump the stuff again. So if I'm working like that, I'm, I'm very likely to be replaced very, very quickly, like I am already redundant. So I think initially people might look slightly better in like an automated online test if they're like, you know, um, filling, if they're doing like a hacker rank type thing as a test in order to get invited to the interview, they can cheat the system and, and like demonstrate skills that they don't have, which is bad. Um, but the thing is that those skills are foundational and you need those skills in order to build the bigger skills that actually build a meaningful career. So at the interview level, things are very, very messy. A lot of organizations are now shifting from remote interviews to in-person interviews because they're harder to cheat. Um, and that's really, yeah, it's really rough. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, let's put our hands together for Sheena again. It was a great talk. Thanks. Thank you.